Today is March 4th and I'm reading from Luke chapter 10. We're witnessing the ever-expanding influence of Jesus over the lives of many people. It began with 12. They were given power and they were given authority. Now, in chapter 10, we are introduced to 70. 70 individuals who have been chosen and are being sent out. He appoints these 70 and he has commissioned them. The Bible says that the harvest, is, this is what Jesus said, the harvest is so great and it's expanding, but there are so few labors. Jesus is almost saying, I can't do it alone here. My 12 can't accomplish all the opportunities that are presenting themselves, and uh, we need more labors. And, and he's applying this to our life, this generation as well, that, that there is a need for us to pray. Pray, pray, pray for laborers. The harvest is ripe. And, um, and Jesus appoints these 70. Look what he tells them to do down in the eighth verse. He says, wherever city you enter, wherever you go, I am, you're going to heal the sick there, and you're going to say to the, them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. They were to look for the man of peace. Now, the man of peace in a household, when they would go to a home, was someone that would welcome them in. There was a certain reception that this individual had. That man of peace was uh, 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 an individual that would be a channel for opening the door for other people that may be uh, open to the kingdom of God. So they were just like, but if they went and that there was not a man of peace, they were rejected or they were told to get out of here. Then we're given this analogy of dusting, uh, brushing the dust off your shoes and moving on. That is just simply letting it go, but looking for the man of peace. And here's what the description here is if you look for the man of peace and they open their home and you go in, then you're going to share with them the kingdom of God. But it's the indication here in the ninth verse is that you're to look for a need. You're to look for a situation and find somebody there that is sick. And if you'll heal that person, if you will heal that individual, that situation, they will see the power of God. They'll see the power of the kingdom of God. And you then will have an entry door. This will be the gateway by which you will be given an audience because they will see the authority. They will see the, uh, you will bring, an, uh, um, it, it will bring a credibility to your life. And they will see that indeed God is with you. And then this is where the door of opportunity for the harvest. And I think it's, a, it's an application in our life in the church. Much of the church, we've lost the power, the sense of authority. We, we don't seem to recognize that nothing has changed here. And many young people reject the uh, principles of the Christian faith because they see no evidence of the things that the Bible talks about. They don't see the power. They don't see the authority. They don't see the evidence of the workings of God. And can you imagine what would happen if we would once again revisit? I don't think the days of miracles are over. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe, in fact, that they're going to be intensifying and increasing. That as we approach the end of the age, we also, as wickedness is increasing, we're going to see the uh, the uh, expansion of kingdom power and kingdom authority. And so can you imagine if we would begin once again to go to people and here's a situation, it's an impossible situation, but we take the name of Jesus and the power that's in Jesus' name and we, uh, we heal the sick and, and, we, and we help people in situations. They see the power of God. They see a supernatural God working in supernatural ways and we suddenly have a captive audience that wishes to hear about the God that we represent. Well, the 70 are sent out. They come back. Look at, I love this passage in verse 17. They return to Jesus and they say this, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they're, they're experiencing this incredible authority that Jesus had imputed to them. So everywhere they're going, obviously they're having success in casting out demons and those that are demonized are being liberated and set free. So they come back to saying, Jesus, they're almost astonished. God, they're saying, Jesus, it's incredible, but, but the demons are subject to us through your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is a picture of of the rule and the reign of, of Satan, the powers of darkness being demolished, being brought down, principalities 
forces, uh, spiritual forces in high play, uh, being broken and brought down. This is uh, a picture of you and I, the power that we have, that when we begin to engage by the authority we have in Jesus' name, by the blood power of Jesus, that we have, uh, we have authority over dark forces. And Jesus is simply affirming, I saw what you're saying about demons being subject to you. I saw the power of darkness. I, I saw principalities demolishing, coming down, uh, falling from heaven. So Jesus says this, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now this is an incredible promise. If we limit this to merely the words spoken to 70 men, then we're missing out on, I believe, an application that is uh, pertinent to us today. I believe that we could read this and we can declare this and we can be recipients of this, that we can have power over all dark forces, over the serpents, over the scorpions, over all the powers of the enemy, that we have this authority in Jesus' name. But look what Jesus says, nevertheless, that is in spite of this reality, in spite of this truth that you have this power and this authority, do not rejoice in this. Don't get excited about that. Don't get distracted by that, that the, these dark spirits are subject to you, but rather look what he says, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Do you know that really this is the most important thing in your life? The miracle of all miracles is the fact that you're saved, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And, and you and I ought to be rejoicing. Don't let that get stale. Don't get, allow that to dry out and become a thing of the past. No, Jesus is saying, yes, it's true. You'll heal the sick. You'll cast out demons. All these things are real, but don't rejoice over that. But listen, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, everything about the fact that John the Baptist, the Bible says, Jesus said is greatest among men, uh, never performed a miracle, never did any supernatural works. And I want to say to you that while we have been given that promise and you and I have a right to participate, Participate in the works of God, the greatest thing in your life, my life, my children's life, all is the fact that we are saved, that we've been delivered from darkness, that the curse has been broken, and we are on our way to an eternal heaven. This is what we ought to live day by day rejoicing about. Now, Jesus introduces an understanding of what it means to really love God and to love your neighbor. So this lawyer comes up to him in about the 25th verse, and, and actually he's coming to test Jesus, the Bible tells us, and he says, teacher, um, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what's written in the law? It's amazing. Jesus always oftentimes asked a question with a question, didn't he? Answer a question with a question. And um, the man answers, the lawyer says, you'll, uh, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and, and with all your mind. And, and, uh, and you're to love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus says to him, you've answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. Well, that wasn't enough for the lawyer. So the lawyer said, well, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus then goes into a discourse about who our neighbor really is. You see, these two laws really that Jesus is identifying sums up all the other laws because they deal with our relationship with God and it deals with our treatment and relationship with those that are around us. And Jesus gives a story. He was great at bringing a story, was telling a story to bring home a point. And he talks about a man who went uh, to Jerusalem and um, he fell among thieves and he is, uh, you know, he's, he's wounded. Uh, they, they, they take his clothes away, uh, they depart, they leave him, he's half dead. And, uh, and the Bible tells, there he is on the street, he's, he's practically lifeless, and uh, a priest came by that road, and he saw him, and he moves to the other side of the road and passes him by. Now, this is interesting because the priest represents the man of God. The priest is one who represents man to God and God to man. And you'd think the priest would definitely be interested, right? And yet he didn't. And so Jesus is saying, did that man understand eternal life? No, because it didn't affect his behavior. He had a office as a priest, but uh, it was all lip service, no heart there. Then he says that there was a, um, a Levite. A Levite was uh, one involved in the priestly duties. That is, they would take care of the synagogues and they would do the, the work of the church, so to speak. And so he comes by, he sees the man that's practically dead. 
he passes by, walks on the other side of the street. And again, interesting, this is a, what we would say, this is supposedly a Christian. This is somebody that, that's su loves, supposed to love God, but, but he doesn't do anything. He'll roll up his sleeve and get involved in helping his fellow man. So he walks on the other side of the street. Well, then there comes the Samaritan. The Samaritans were not very well liked. This was a racial thing. They, uh, the, they were just, the Jews just despised the Samaritans and they didn't get along. They called them dogs. And, uh, but the Samaritan comes, he sees this uh, this man this Jew that's there and the Bible says that he had compassion and so he bandages him up he he takes care of him he goes to an inn uh, he he leaves him there for um, for uh, a room a housing and he pays the innkeep take care of him and gives him some money and um, and then Jesus asked the question which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves and uh, the lawyer couldn't help but to answer and say, well, it was the one that showed mercy on him. And he said, yeah, go and do likewise. And this is, this is the, mandate of the mandate of the kingdom. Really, there's both the spiritual experience of Jesus coming into our life, and there's the practical application. I think what Jesus is saying here is that we live in a fallen world. We live in, a, in, in this hour in which people are hurting and, and they're, you know, they've been abused and they've been mistreated and, and they have nothing. And we can just dismiss it. We can be our, uh, we are going to have a holy club. We can walk by people that are in need all around us. But that's not practical Christianity. And what he's saying that we are salt and we are light. And he's saying that if we're really going to fulfill the law of loving God and loving our neighbor, then we're going to get engaged and involved in the lives of people around us. This is why it's so important that we understand the aspect of loving people, uh, helping people, serving people, uh, feeding the poor, uh, helping those, those that are in prison. All these things are means by which that we get involved with people. The final part of this is Mary Martha. Um, Jesus has been uh, welcomed by Martha into her house. And, uh, uh, but she's getting things around Mary. Uh, it says, uh, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So here it is. Mary is sitting there just devouring Jesus, loving Jesus, wanting to be around Jesus. But Martha's slaving away in the kitchen. And, uh, but the Bible says that she was distracted with much serving. And uh, she approached Jesus. She's irritated. She's a little upset. And, uh, and she says to Jesus, do you not care that my sister's left me and I'm serving all by myself? And here she is sitting in here with you while I'm in there sweating and laboring away. And uh, tell her to come and help me. That's what really um, Martha's saying. So uh, Jesus uh, said to her, Martha, now think about this. When you're irritated, you know somebody's got the position to get intervene and resolve a conflict. And it, it turns on you. And instead of Jesus coming to your defense, he goes to the very one that you are irritated and agitated with. And Jesus says to Martha, 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 you are worried and you're troubled about many things, but only one thing is needed. And Martha has chosen that good thing which will not be taken away from her. What an, uh, an incredible analogy. I don't know. We read later that Martha and Mary together and um, Martha's in the kitchen cooking. Mary is worshiping, loving on Jesus, and no words are spoken. I think it's a lesson here to understand there are different callings in our life. And um, sometimes we feel as though we're getting the short end of the stick, that we feel as though, um, you know, we're doing all the work, we're doing all the effort and all the labor. But it really comes to heart motivation. What is your purpose and what is your reason? Was Martha in the kitchen to serve Jesus? Mary was serving Jesus. But she was loving on Jesus, spending time. And Jesus identifies it, that, Martha, you're distracted by a lot of different things that really maybe not quite as important at the moment as what Mary's doing right now because she's sitting at the word, she's listening to the word of God. And, uh, and, and Jesus saying, just let her alone. I think that when we have a calling and we have giftings, that we've got to learn to take delight in those callings, those, gift, those giftings. And we've got to worry, not worry about other people and what they do with their life. We've got to make sure our heart's right. We're loving God. We're serving God for the right reasons, for the right motives. And if we do what Jesus said here, then uh, when we choose that good part, serving God out of a good heart, a pure heart, loving on Jesus, it will not be taken away. Well, I pray today, listen, that you today will serve 
with, a, with the perspective that you are kingdom sons and daughters and you're doing it for his honor and for his glory. Even if nobody else gives you any credit, even if nobody else notices what you're doing, I can guarantee you this, there's someone in heaven who does know what you're doing and your reward is being reserved. You will be blessed by what you're doing. Hey, have a great and blessed day.